sweet listeners. I apologize. I read to y'all last night, and poof, it just went black. 20 odd minutes, maybe ish. Went into the universe, never to be seen again. So, let's hope this takes David's memorial light. I'm not going to turn these lights on just so we can focus on that. I think this is chapter 8, but we'll see when I get to, I should know since I read it, but this is part 2 of it. Come on. Okay. Part 2. Ellen proved to be grim but unafraid. Her sour old face looked triumphantly at the inspector. It's a shocking business, sir, and I never thought I'd live to find myself in a house where that sort of thing has been going on. But in a way, I can't say that it surprises me. I ought to have given my notice in long ago, and that's a fact. I don't like the language that's used in this house, and I don't like the amount of drink that's taken, and I don't approve of the goings on. Goings on there've been. I've nothing against Mrs. Crump, but Crump and that girl Gladys just don't know what proper service is, but it's the goings on that I mind about most. Mama used to talk about goings on. <laughs> oh, let's see where. What goings on do you mean exactly? You'll soon hear about them if you don't know already. It's common talk all over the place. They've been seen here, there, and everywhere. All this pretending to play golf or tennis. And I've seen things with my own eyes in this house. The library door was open and there they were, kissing and canoodling. The venom of the spinster was deadly. Neil really felt it unnecessary to say, whom do you mean, but he said it nevertheless. Who should I mean? The mistress and that, and that man. No shame about it, they hadn't. But if you ask me, the master had got wise to it, put someone on to watch them he had. Divorce, that's what it would have come to. Instead, it's come to this. When you say this, you mean... You've been asking questions, sir, about what the master ate and drank and who gave it to him. They're in it together, sir. That's what I'd say. He got the stuff from somewhere and she gave it to him. That was the way of it, I've no doubt. Have you ever seen any yew berries in the house or thrown away anywhere? The small eyes glinted curiously. You? Y-E-W. Nasty, poisonous stuff. Never, never you touch those berries, my mother said to me when I was a child. Was that what was used, sir? We don't know yet what was used. I've never seen her fiddling about with you, Ellen sounded disappointed. No, I, I can't say I've seen anything of that kind. Neil questioned her about the grain found in Fortescue's pocket, but here again he drew a blank. No, sir, I don't know nothing about that. He went on to further questions, but with no gainful result. Finally, he asked if he could see Miss Ramsbottom. <laughs> you love these names. Ellen looked doubtful. I could ask her, but it's not everyone she'll see. She's a very old lady, you know, and she's a bit odd. The inspector pressed his demand, and rather unwillingly, Ellen led him along a passage and up a short flight of stairs to what he thought had probably been designed as a nursery suite. He glanced out of a passage window as he followed her and saw Sergeant Hay standing by the yew tree talking to a man who was evidently a gardener. Ellen tapped on a door, and when she received an answer, opened it and said, There's a police gentleman here who would like to speak to you, miss. 
The answer was apparently in the affirmative, for she drew back and motioned Neil to go in. The room he entered was almost fantastically over-furnished. <laughs> kind of like it here. Lisa, it looks nice. <laughs> you can see the floor. Thank you, Dory. Uh, la, 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 la. The inspector felt rather as though he had taken a step backward into not merely Edwardian, but Victorian times. I love that. Uh, at a table drawn up to a gas fire, an old lady was sitting, laying out a patience. She wore a maroon-colored dress, and her sparse gray hair was slicked down each side of her face. Without looking up or discontinuing her game, she said impatiently, Well, come in, come in, sit down if you like. The invitation was not easy to accept as every chair appeared to be covered with tracts or publications of a religious nature. As he moved them slightly aside on the sofa, Miss Ramsbottom asked sharply, Interested in mission work? Well, uh, I'm afraid I'm not very, ma'am. Wrong. You should be. That's where the Christian spirit is nowadays, darkest Africa. Had a young clergy clergyman here last week, black as your hat, but a true Christian. <laughs> What's that got to do with it? Inspector Neal found it a little difficult to know what to say. The old lady further disconcerted him by snapping, I haven't got a wireless. I beg your pardon? Oh, I, I thought perhaps you came about a wireless license or one of those silly forms. Well, man, what is it? I'm sorry to have to tell you, Miss Ramsbottom, that your brother-in-law, Mr. Fortescue, was taken suddenly ill and died this morning. Miss Ramsbottom continued with her patience. She's playing solitaire. I don't know what that's got to do with P-A-T-I-E-N-C-E. -E, without any sign of perturbation, merely remarking in a conversational way, struck down at last in his arrogance and sinful pride, well, it had to come. I hope it's not a shock to you. It obviously wasn't, but the inspector wanted to hear what she would say. Miss Ramsbottom gave him a sharp glance over the top of her spectacles and said, If you mean I'm not distressed, that's quite right. Rex Fortescue was always a sinful man, and I never liked him. His death was very sudden, as befits the ungodly, said the old lady with satisfaction. It seems possible that he may have been poisoned. The inspector paused to observe the effect he had made. He did not seem to have made any. Miss Ramsbottom merely murmured, Red seven on black eight. Now I can move up the king. Struck apparently by the inspector's silence, she stopped with a card poised in her hand and said sharply, Well, what do you expect me to say? I didn't poison him, if that's what you want to know. Have you any idea who might have done so? Well, that's a very improper question, said the old lady sharply. Living in this house are two of my dead sister's children. I decline to believe that anybody with ram ram's bottom blood in them could be guilty of murder, because it's murder your meaning, isn't it? I didn't say so, madam. Of course it's a murder. Plenty of people have wanted to murder Rex in their time. A very unscrupulous man, and old sins have long shadows, as the saying goes. Have you anyone in particular in mind? Miss Ramsbottom swept up the cards and rose to her feet. She was a tall woman. I think you'd better go now, she said. She spoke without anger, but with a kind of cold finility. If you want my opinion, she went on, it was probably one of the servants. The butler looks to me a bit of a rascal, and that parlor maid is definitely subnormal. <laughs> Good evening. Inspector Neal found himself meekly walking out. Certainly a remarkable old lady, nothing to be got out of her. He came down the stairs into the square hall to find himself suddenly face to face with a tall, dark girl. She was wearing a damp Macintosh, and she stared into his face with a curious blankness. 
I've just come back, she said, and they told me about Father that he's dead. I'm afraid that's true. She pushed out a hand behind her as though blindly seeking for support. She touched an oak chest and slowly, stiffly, she sat down on it. Oh, oh no, she said no. Slowly, two tears ran down her cheeks. It's awful, she said. I didn't think that I even liked him. I thought I hated him, but that can't be so, or I wouldn't mind. I do mind. She sat there staring in front of her, and again tears forced themselves from her eyes and down her cheeks. Presently, she spoke again rather breathlessly. The awful thing is that it makes everything come right. I mean... Gerald and I can get married now. I can do everything that I want to do, but I hate it happening this way. I don't want Father to be dead. Oh, I don't. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. For the first time since he had come to U Tree Lodge, Inspector Neal was startled by what seemed to be genuine grief for the dead man. Yep, that's the end of Chapter 8. Oh, please don't disappear. Let me keep reading. Chapter 9. Sounds like the wife to me, said the assistant commissioner. He had been listening attentively to Inspector Neal's report. It had been an admirable presses of the case, short, but with no relevant detail left out. Yes, said the A.C. It looks like the wife. What do you think yourself, Neal, eh? Inspector Neal said it looked like the wife to him, too. He reflected cyn cynically that it usually was the wife or the husband, as the case might be. She had the opportunity, all right. And motive? The A.C. Pauls, there is motive? Oh, I think so, sir. This Mr. Dubois, you know, think he was in it, too? No, I shouldn't say that, sir, Inspector Neal weighed the idea. A bit too fond of his own skin for that. He may have guessed what was in her mind, but I shouldn't imagine that he instigated it. No, too careful. Much too careful. Well, we mustn't jump to conclusions, but it seems a good working hypothesis. What about the other two who had opportunity? That's the daughter and the daughter-in-law. The daughter was mixed up with a young man whom the father didn't want her to marry, and he definitely wasn't marrying her unless she had the money. That gives her motive. As to the daughter-in-law, I wouldn't like to say. I don't know enough about her yet, but any of the three of them could have poisoned him. And I don't see how anyone else could have done so. The parlor maid, the butler, the cook, they all handled the breakfast or brought it in. But I don't see how any of them could have been sure of Fortescue himself getting the taxine and nobody else. That is, if it was taxine. The AC said, it was taxine, all right. I just got the preliminary report. Well, that settles it then, said Inspector Neal. We can go ahead. Servants seem all right. The butler and the parlor maid both seem nervous. There's nothing uncommon about that. It often happens. <clears throat> the cook's fighting mad, and the housemaid was grimly pleased. In fact, all quite natural and normal. There's nobody else whom you consider suspicious in any way? No, I don't think so, sir. Involuntarily, <clears throat> Inspector Neal's mind went back to Mary Dove and her enigmatic smile. There had surely been a faint yet definite look of antagonism. Aloud, he said, now that we know it's taxing, there ought to be some evidence to be got as to how it was obtained or prepared. Just so, well, go ahead, Neil. By the way, Mr. Percival Fortescue is, is here now. I've had a word or two with him, and he's waiting to see you. We've located the other son, too. He's in Paris at the Bristol, leaving today. You'll have met him at the airport, I suppose. Yes, sir, that was my idea. Well, you'd better see Percival Fortescue now. They see chuckled Percy Prim. That's what he is. 
Uh, Mr. Percival Fortescue was a neat, fair man of 30-odd with pale hair and eyelashes with a slightly pe pedantic way of speech. This has been a terrible shock to me, Inspector Neal, as you can well imagine. It must have been, Mr. Fortescue, said Inspector Neal. I can only say that my father was perfectly well when I left home the day before yesterday. This food poisoning, or whatever it was, must have been very sudden. It was very sudden, yes, but it wasn't food poisoning, Mr. Fortescue. Percival stared and frowned, no. So that's why he broke off. Your father, said Inspector Neal, was poisoned by the administration of taxine. Taxine? I've never heard of it. Very few people have, I should imagine. It's a poison that takes effect very suddenly and drastically. The frown deepened. Are you telling me, Inspector, that my father was deliberately poisoned by someone? It would seem so, yes, sir. Well, that's terrible. Yes, indeed, Mr. Fortescue. Percival murmured, I understand now their attitude in the hospital. They're referring, they're referring me here. He broke off. After a pause, he went on. The funeral? He spoke interrogatively. The inquest is fixed for tomorrow after the post-mortem. The, the proceedings at the inquest will be purely formal, and the inquest will be adjourned. I understand that's usually the case. Yes, sir, nowadays. May I ask, have you formed any ideas, any suspicions of who could... Really, I, again he broke off, it's rather early days for that, Mr. Fortescue murmured Neil. Yes, I suppose so. All the same, it would be helpful to us, Mr. Fortescue, if you could give us some idea of your father's testamentary dispositions, or perhaps you could put me in touch with his solicitor. <clears throat> His solicitors are Billingsby, Horsethorpe, and Walters of Bedford Square. As far as his will goes, I think I can more or less tell you its main dispositions. If you will be kind enough to do so, Mr. Fortescue, it's a routine that has to be gone through, I'm afraid. My father made a new will on the occasion of his marriage two years ago, said Percival precisely. My father left the sum of a hundred thousand pounds to his wife, absolutely, and fifty thousand pounds to my sister Elaine. I'm his uh, res hyphenated and I'm two lines. Residuary legatee. I am already, of course, a partner in the firm. There was no bequest to your brother, Lancelot Fortescue? No, there is an estrangement of long standing between my father and my brother. Neil threw a sharp glance at him, but Percival seemed quite sure of his statement. So, as the will stands, said Inspector Neil, the three people who, stain, who stand to gain are... Mrs. Fortescue, Miss Ellen Fortescue, and yourself? I don't think I shall be much of a gainer, Percival sighed. There are death duties, you know, Inspector, and of late my father has been well. All I can say is highly injudicious in some of his financial dealings. You and your father have not seen eye to eye lately about the conduct of the business. Inspector Neal threw out the question in a genial manner. I put my point of view to him, but alas, Percival shrugged his shoulders. Put it rather forcibly, didn't you, Neal inquired. In fact, not to put too fine a point on it, there was quite a row about it, wasn't there? I should hardly say that, Inspector. A red flush of annoyance mounted to Percival's forehead. Perhaps the dispute you had was about some other matter then, Mr. Fortescue? There was no dispute, Inspector. 
Quite sure of that, Mr. Fortescue? Well, no matter. Did I understand that your father and brother are still estranged? That is so. Then perhaps you can tell me what this means. Neil handed him the phone message Mary Dove had jotted down. Percival read it and uttered an exclamation of surprise and annoyance. He seemed both incredulous and angry. I can't understand this. I really can't. I can hardly believe it. It seems to be true, though, Mr. Fortescue. Your brother is arriving from Paris today. But it's extraordinary, quite extraordinary. No, I really can't understand it. Your father said nothing to you about it? He certainly did not. How outrageous of him to go behind my back and send for Lance. You've no idea, I suppose, why he did such a thing? Of course I have, and it's all on a par with his behavior lately. Crazy. Unaccountable. It's got to be stopped. I, Percival, came to an abrupt stop. The color ebbed away again from his pale face. I'd forgotten, he said. For the moment, I'd forgotten that my father was dead. Inspector Neal shook his head sympathetically. Percival Fortescue prepared to take his departure as he picked up his hat. He said, call upon me if there's anything I can do, but I suppose, he paused, you'll be coming down to U Tree Lodge? Yes, Mr. Fortescue, I've got a man in charge there now. Percival shuddered in a fastidious way. It will be all the most unpleasant to think such a thing should happen to us. He sighed and moved towards the door. I shall be at the office most of the day. There's a lot to be seen to there, but I shall get down to Utree Lodge this evening. Quite so, sir. Percival Fortescue went out. Percy Prim, <laughs> murmured Neil. Sergeant Hay, who was sitting unobtrusively by the wall, looked up and said, Sir? interrogatively. Then as Neil did not reply, he asked, What do you make of it all, sir? I don't know, said Neil. He quoted softly, they're all very unpleasant people. Sergeant Hay looked somewhat puzzled. Alice in Wonderland, said Neil. Don't you know you're Alice, Hay? It's a classic, isn't it, sir, said Hay. Third program stuff. I don't listen to the third program. And that's all of nine. And I hope this doesn't disappear. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Hope you had a wonderful Easter. Bye-bye.